Welcome, everyone. This is the second annual Ian McCalman Lecture, sponsored by the Sydney Environment Institute here at the University of Sydney. My task is to give a little bit of a background uh, to the lecture, uh, a little bit about Professor Ian McCalman and why this event is so important uh, in our annual calendar. And then I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Dinesh Waterwell. Uh, to start, though, I do want to acknowledge and please bear with me, I do want to acknowledge the climate crisis that we are in the midst of and what we have experienced over this summer. Everyone in here has been either directly impacted in some way or knows someone who has. There's at most a one degree of separation from the fires, the lost homes, the lost loved ones, human and non-human, from the health impacts of the smoke. And there's not anyone who hasn't been impacted in some way by the loss of places, of animals, of unique ecological systems, of memory, of identity, and of meaning. One of our colleagues, Danny Salamier, made a powerful point the other evening at an event that while we are tempted to call this a tragedy, that really is the wrong word. Tragedy is something that's due to fate, from circumstances out of our hands, a form of unfortunate destiny. But this situation that we're in is not a tragedy. It is by design. It's purposeful. It is the reality, a specific reality, of decisions by specific people and specific organizations. And to use Danny's term, which has gained some resonance since she's written about it, this is about omnicide. This is about the purposeful killing of everything. Now, someone who has been involved in issues of climate politics and climate justice for a long time, the reality of what is playing out in front of us and beneath us, the reality of all this is really a political reality, uh, a result of political and corporate decisions. It's depressing uh, and it is angering. And there's a particular kind of grief, I think, in the scientific and the academic communities of seeing the results of intensive, important research and clear recommendations that have been ignored, uh, resulting in the devastation on the ground around us. And the reality is that in Australia, and really in my other country, the US, I joke that as a dual citizen, I'm subject to bad governance twice as much as anybody else. <laughs> but we have governments that like to declare their allegiance to something called Western culture and tradition but who ignore two absolutely central tenets of that tradition. <clears throat> that is, of course, science uh, and the idea of human rights. Right? Ignoring science and criminalizing migrants uh, and protest. So hypocrisy and omnicide go together. In response to all this, a number of my colleagues uh, have called for a declaration of a climate emergency, as our friends in the law school have done. And I fully support such a declaration, but I think it's important to note that when Extinction Rebellion first articulated its demands, the very first demand was simply to tell the truth about climate change. For many, that's turned into this declaration of climate emergencies. But I think the university and the institute have a special role to play in telling the truth about climate change. That's the role that we play, the Sydney Environment Institute, that's the role that our colleagues and collaborators will continue to play. So over the course of the coming year, we'll be hosting a series of events focused on telling the truth, focused on action, on biodiversity, on water, on heat waves, on air pollution, on energy, on climate anxiety and grief and loss, on sea level rise and coastlines, on business risks, on Aboriginal land management, on waste, on campus sustainability, on climate and multi-species justice, and more. These will be our conversations and our contributions over the course of this year. SCI works with an amazing array of scholars from across campus and with an incredible range of external partners as well. And we all together will continue to tell the truths about the crucial issues of environment, sustainability, and responsibility. And tonight is just one example of that kind 
of truth-telling. But before getting to an introduction uh, of our speaker, I need to tell you a little bit about the background of this Ian McCalman lecture, because Ian is the core reason why we have a Sydney Environment Institute uh, that can actually do this kind of work. So Ian McCalman is an emeritus professor now, former research professor of history and the co-founder uh, of SEI. His contributions to history, to environmental humanities, to the university, to academia in general have been recognized in many ways, um, from the Order of Australia to membership in both, both the Academy of the Humanities and the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, there are not many of those, uh, and as a fellow of the Royal Historical Society in the UK. His work has ranged from a history of the radical underworld of London through his incredibly important and popular work on Darwin to his passionate history of the Great Barrier Reef and much, much more to come. But Ian's incredible scholarship and these recognitions are just part of his academic life. He's been a leader building academic communities, mentoring students and colleagues. And of course, it's Ian's mentorship where things get personal for me as he reached out to me even before I arrived on this campus at the start of 2011. And we worked closely together for eight incredibly collaborative and productive years. The SEI was de designed based on Ian's experience leading other projects and institutes. Uh, and it's really his leadership uh, that was the key to our initial success. And I've said before how fortunate I am and the university is that Ian finished this part of his career uh, with SEI and how proud I am that Ian describes the development of SEI as one of the highlights of his career. And Ian's legacy here is an institute that embodies what a broadly multidisciplinary environmental study center can be, what it should do, and how it, ha and how it can encompass a broad range of academics and the public. Now, Ian retired from the university at the end of 2018, meaning last year was the very first year of SEI without him. Um, and it was, without a doubt, one of the most difficult years of my own career. Uh, it's one thing to stand on the shoulder of a giant. It's another thing to stand on one's own. But Ian left SEI with a solid foundation, an identity, a purpose, a mission, a process of bringing a diversity of voices together in and out uh, of the university. And of course, I'm also privileged to continue the work of SEI with the other co-founder and builder of the Institute, uh, our incomparable director, uh, Michelle St. Anne, who helps to provide the vision and skill that's crucial to our success. So all of that really makes it pretty simple to explain why we honor Ian with this annual event in his name. The annual McCalman Lecture aims to highlight, in particular, early and mid-career researchers who represent work that crosses disciplinary boundaries that aims to impact scholarship and public discourse on key environmental issues. We think it's a fitting tribute to Ian and to the scholars who embrace the difficult but important and crucial space that he's forged. So before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd just like everyone to join me in thanking Ian McCalman for the work that he's done and contributed to the university. Now we are also incredibly fortunate to have tonight's speaker as our second inaugural Ian McCalman lecturer. Dr. Dinesh Waterwell, who's a senior lecturer and now head of department of sociology and social policy, I'm so sorry, uh, has been with SEI from day one, literally from the beginning. Um, first as a representative of the Human Animal Research Network uh, on campus, then as the head of that network, and now as an integral part of our multi-species justice collective. Tanesh is a social and political theorist whose focus has been on human rights, on disability rights, but also on a range of issues surrounding justice and rights for non-human beings. His book, The War Against Animals, is an argument that this is exactly the current state of affairs in human-animal relations, a war. Uh, I really enjoyed one reviewer's review of, of Dinesh's book, that he approached the book 
with some skepticism. Certainly, war is just a, a metaphor, right? Um, and then he tells in this review how he eventually gets convinced of the material and the literal accuracy of that term. How else do you describe a relationship that's primarily about domination and violence and extermination? Now, unlike past work in animal rights, the Nash's work is not solely on the suffering of animals, it's on the institutionalization of violence. And tonight, Dinesh will again address the institutionalization of violence against animals. But he'll contrast that with one of the more common ways of thinking about animal rights, uh, that it's an individual human responsibility, that's an individual ethical choice. And instead, Dinesh will lay out an argument for structural and institutional change rather than simply individual choices. The topic tonight is key to a broadly interdisciplinary approach to our environmental crisis. It's linked to one of our key interests at the Sydney Environment Institute, which is about how we need to change, change practices, change actions, change the flows of materials through our everyday lives with more just and more sustainable systems. So the program for tonight is pretty straightforward. Uh, we will hear from Dinesh, and that's it. We'll hear from Dinesh, and then we will retire to the back um, for uh, some treats, some vegan treats, uh, and we'll toast Ian, we'll toast Dinesh, we'll toast the ongoing work of all of our colleagues, affiliates, researchers, and staff at SEI. So it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce and to welcome Dr. Dinesh Waterwell to deliver this year's Ian McCalman Lecture. Thank you so much, David, for that really generous welcome. Um, could I thank Yvonne for the generous welcome to country? Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay respects to the people and knowledges that exist in this country, and also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, thank you to Baptism and Josephine for the amazing sounds that we heard earlier, and my thanks to David and Michelle and the whole team at SEI for the wonderful honour um, of presenting this lecture this year. Um, I also want to acknowledge Ian. Uh, Ian, to me, reflects the values I aspire to as an academic, openness, generosity, curiosity, all blended with a passion for justice. In this context, it is such a delight to be able to present this talk, which I hope is informed by the generous spirit that Ian has cultivated throughout his career. I want to begin my talk by marking the terrible moment many of us inhabit today, after the last few months of devastation which have swept through so many lives. I don't think it's hyperbolic to state that the bush fires have marked a monumental disaster in Australia, which has massively impacted not only humans, but animals and the environment, allowing us um, in some ways, in a ways that defy measurement and defy imagination. The connections between human-induced climate change and the catastrophe around us have become undeniable and I think create a bittersweet opportunity for change, allowing us to consider fresh the meaning of environmental justice. Traditional understandings of environmental justice were interested in the distributional inequalities associated with the environmental consequences of human activity. For example, the way that industrial pollution always seemed to impact the poorest on the planet, even though these communities do not seem to benefit economically from the proceeds of industrialised production. More recent work in environmental justice, including from the SEI director, David Schlossberg, has sought to highlight that injustices, either in the distribution of environmental consequences or the failures to recognise status and rights, go well beyond the human. Today, it is apparent that we must take into account impacts for animals, and the environment as subjects of justice. Indeed, for better or worse, the devastation of the last three months in Australia has highlighted that climate change represents an environmental justice issue 
that well and truly goes beyond the human. It is not just that the effects of anthropogenic climate change will disproportionately impact the poorest humans on the planet. Instead, as we have witnessed, the climate emergency will devastate the lives and communities of non-humans non as well on a massive scale. Like other environmental justice issues, those who benefit from environmental devastation perhaps are shielded from its worst effects, while those who have no say in decisions that contribute to global warming are those that are harmed without any benefit. Underlining this is a complete failure of recognition a systematic failure to recognise and value lives and flourishing in the multiplicity of life forms which surround us. My talk today is about animal agriculture and its future. And I recognise that this talk arrives at a point of crisis where we must take seriously a range of possible levers before us to mitigate the worst possible futures associated with global warming. In my view, the climate emergency create, <coughs> creates a new context which changes the parameters for how we think about animal cult uh, agriculture. In my view, it means that we are finally ready to have a serious conversation about how we transform this aspect of our food system and take seriously justice for humans and non-humans as part of this process. In the not too distant past, Critical discussions about animal agriculture were framed in relation to prominent debates within animal rights theory and environmental ethics. On one hand, from the 1970s onwards, prominent voices in animal ethics, such as those of Peter Singer, asked significant moral questions about our mainstream uses of animals. In many cases, animal ethics was responding to the horrors of industrial animal agriculture particularly forms of agriculture utilising intensive systems of, of containment and the mechanisation of key processes, such as that of slaughter. Animal rights theory looked at the factory farm, at, inten at intensive animal agriculture, and I think for good reason, found that there were few consistent moral arguments in favour of using animals in these ways. While animal rights theory agreed that industrial animal agriculture posed an ethical problem, sorry, an ethical problem, the strategies proposed for challenging the institutional forms of animal agriculture appeared focused upon individual actions. Peter Singer's influential 1975 book, Animal Liberation, included vegetarian recipes in the back, an odd inclusion for a work of applied philosophy. I don't mean to suggest that Singer thought that a commitment to mass vegetarianism was the only strategy available to counter animal agriculture. Actually, a close reading of animal liberation makes clear that this was not the case. However, the inclusion of the cookbook in one of the many appendices of this important work in moral philosophy marks something distinct about the way in which advocacy around the rights of animals has occurred over the last 50 years. This advocacy has featured a very strong strong emphasis on personal practice. Indeed, I would say an over-reliance on individual change as a strategy as opposed to systems change. Thus, while animal agriculture is presented within much animal rights theory as a social and political problem of how societies manage food supplies and the roles of animals within it, the easiest, solu easiest solution proposed was for individuals to make an individual decision to opt out of supporting animal agriculture by eliminating animal products from their diets or eliminating animal products from what they wear. All of this happened in a context in which animal rights theory and environmental ethics appeared at odds with each other. At least one prominent fault line in the disagreement between animal rights theory and environmental ethics was in relation to the rights of individuals and the flourishing of communities. Traditional animal rights theory tended to emphasise the individual rights of animals and count as harms infringements of those rights. Environmentalists, on the other hand, tended to speak about the flourishing of ecosystems or species, where individual harms were perhaps tolerable in the name of the greater good. Thus, an environmentalist might be comfortable with the elimination of non-native non species within an environment because of the perceived benefits to an ecosystem or other populations. Further, while many environmentalists have recognised that many forms of industrialised animal agriculture pose environmental problems, 
the objection to animal agriculture is not directly informed by any concern or by direct concern for the rights of animals. Thus, environmentalists may support forms of intensive animal agriculture that offer reduced environmental impact, or alternatively, argue for modest, low-scale animal agriculture as a sustainable alternative to large-scale animal agriculture. All of this potentially placed environmentalists at odds with animal rights people. However, something has palpably changed over the last decade around the po politics of meat. A decade ago, it seemed that discussions about the problems with animal ag agriculture were extraordinarily fringe in nature. It would be rare to see articles in major newspapers, for example, questioning the status of animals as food. At the same time, many would be aware of the cultural bat battles which sur have surrounded vegan and vegetarian diets over the last decade with the, meat with the meat industry, think about those Australia Day lamb ads, and major media outlets belittling those who chose to pursue plant-based diets. However, today there are almost daily media reports and opinion pieces which have drawn attention to the problems surrounding animal agriculture, and at the same time a veritable explosion of interest in plant-based diets. Veganism has gone mainstream, it would seem, shifting from a marginal dietary practice to something which is now being actively embraced by major supermarkets and fast food chains. Perhaps the, most single, the single most important driver of this growing awareness are the undeniable connections between animal agriculture and anthropogenic climate change. The numbers remain open to debate. However, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization suggests that total emissions from global livestock represent 14.5% of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Last year's climate change and land report provided some of the strongest language we have seen yet on this issue from the IPCC. The report argued that, quote, a dietary shift from meat can reduce greenhouse gases, gas emissions, reduce cropland and pasture requirements, enhance biodiversity protections, and reduce mitigation costs, end quote. In particular, the IPCC noted the potential of this transformation in allowing for adaption and response to climate change, particularly in responding to deforestation and soil erosion. To an extent, the developments over the last few years, at least in my mind, have shifted the grounds for how we think about animal agriculture. This does not mean that the old debate between animal rights and, and environmental ethics has been resolved, far from it. However, the reality of climate change has placed before us a concrete challenge which relates to our food systems and a very clear message that we will need to massively reduce the number of animals being used for food in order to prevent a global warming scenario that we cannot adapt to. If we add these concerns about the environmental impact of meat production to prevailing concerns about the ethics of animal-based food industries, we have, I think, a curious situation. Perhaps for the first time, animal advocates and environmentalists can find a space of agreement on, environmental ag on animal agriculture. Whatever the shape of our future food systems, our planet cannot sustain meat consumption, consumption at the levels at which, we, which currently prevail. We can surely agree that change is necessary. So how do we get there? The challenge is I don't think we have anything like a clear roadmap for how we might imagine restructuring food systems away from large-scale large animal agriculture. Indeed, it feels like the only solution being offered at the moment is to encourage people to, quote, eat less meat. We have prominent animal advocates arguing for people to go vegan. We have seen an emergence of strong messaging from environmentalists also recommending dietary change, either encouraging people to abandon meat or reduce their consumption. This is now supported by scientists, including the IPCC, who, who as I have mentioned, acknowledge that reducing meat consumption is a viable solution. At the same time, newspapers and, and the internet seem awash with vegan recipes, while, as I have mentioned, Supermarkets and fast food outlets now seem to have embraced plant-based foods as a profitable outlet. However, all of this to me represents something of a framing problem we have in relation to meat, namely that we focus on consumption rather than the, the problem of production. 
This is odd, since much discourse around climate action today has thankfully moved away from individualistic obsessions around climate footprints towards understanding instead the, the need for structures and institutions to change in order to address the climate emergency. This, does, this means that we do not expect that we can leave the problem of mitigating, for example, fossil fuel use to consumers alone. For example, by waiting for individuals to buy solar panels to deal with coal. Instead, we know that the debate over coal should centre on regulation of the coal industry and structural changes to end the use of coal as an energy source, including, hopefully, fair transitions for those employed within these industries. In a similar vein, I want to stress that what is missing today in relation to animal agriculture is a conversation about the production of animals as food. This is now a structural problem in our food system that we have inherited and we must deal with collectively and not simply imagine it is up to consumers to make different individual choices. Taking this stance does not necessarily downplay the role of individual choice. The choices we all individually make are important, but it seeks instead to swing the pendulum back towards the, pro the problem of production. Here comes the jacket. It is hot up here. About seven years ago, I began a project of slow reading Karl Marx, and particularly his work, Capital. For those who, of you who have read this painfully dense work, I offer my commiserations. <laughs> Marx is incredibly difficult to read because he presents a very different way to look at the economy and its interaction with society. However, in amidst all that complexity, there are at least two things I learned which I think are valuable for thinking about animal products and their relationship to our economic system and the climate emergency. And in case anyone is worried, we don't need to sign up as card-carrying Marxists to take on these messages. The first message is that for Marx, it is production in economies rather than consumption which we need to understand. This is because production sits at the centre of the incentive structure for capitalism. His story is perhaps familiar to some of you already, but let me quickly explain so that we're at least on the same page. For Marx, what guides the logic of production is the acquisition of value through the production process. You and I go to work because we need a wage to survive. But in Marx's theory, the owner of production, i.e. the business owner, employs us not because they want to do us a beneficial service, but because we can get paid less than the value that we produce. That is, in shorthand, the capitalist can make a profit from production by exploiting the labour within. You and I might disagree ideologically about whether Marx is correct in his summary of capitalist production. However, I think for me there are some interesting implications for how we think about production, its relation to the climate emergency, and how we think about the production of animal products in relation to consumption. This is because I believe Marx names a rationality that I think we can see around us, namely that we produce goods and services in a way that is frequently disconnected from need. This is because the immediate object of production is the value that can be extra extracted from this production, namely profit. We hope, perhaps in vain, that the free market will align in such a way as for economies to produce things that are actually necessary for the flourishing of lives. And of course, occasionally it does. But we are confronted by a reality, by the reality of the overproduction of commodities almost everywhere, which do not seem to align in any ideal way with the fundamental needs of societies. In fact, as climate change shows us, the needs of the economy continually expand and extract profit at odds with the flourishing needs of life on this planet. This is because the rationality for, the produc for, production, uh, for production is the value that can be derived from this production through the exploitation of the energies and labours within the production process. But we don't need to think about labour as something that only humans do. Recently, a range of theorists, including green theorists, have pointed out that capitalism does not simply focus on human labourers, but extracts the energies and labour of nature as a whole. Recent thinkers, such as Jason Moore, have argued that we need to understand the interaction between capitalism and nature with fresh eyes, recognising that the appropriation of natural resources, the environment, 
was as central to the story of capitalism as the exploitation of wage labour. The reason I think these accounts are use, offer, offer us a useful diagnosis, no, diagnosis of the relation between capitalism and the climate emergency is the very real sense that we have an economic system that will continue to plunder the planet, to suck it dry and watch it burn in the name of profit. Here it is not just human labour that is the object of exploitation, but everything it would seem. Animals, natural resources on the land, in the sea, under the ground, are sucked into the machine of our economy in order to chase value. The destruction of the entangled human and non-human lives and communities that follows these processes is treated as simply an unfortunate byproduct of economic progress. Here the politics of consumption still has a place. It is still part of the reality. And I certainly don't mean to say that the decisions of consumers do, that the decisions of consumers do not drive economic systems. We all consume and our demand for consumption products shapes the reality of the economic system that we see before us. However, the demand to profit from production is also part of the economic picture. If we want to address the problem, we cannot do so through the lens of consumption alone. Uh, we need to look instead at production and its relationship to the economic system. It is here that I want to discuss the second perspective I have gained from reading Marx, and this relates to the role of animals as a consumption commodity. If we examine the use of animals as food over the last 60 years, that is as long as the UN Food and Agriculture Organization has maintained records, we can notice some important, and perhaps at least for animal advocates, disturbing trends. We are at a point in history where we use animals for food on an un completely unprecedented scale. Today, humans extinguish the lives of an extraordinary number of animals as part of global food production, a number that has continued to grow. In 2017, approximately 75 billion land animals were killed for human consumptions. consumption. Chickens alone, who I'll mention in a moment, comprise some 66 billion of these animals. It's difficult to say how many fish are killed um, annually, although the figure has been estimated to be close to three trillion animals per year. It would be easy to conclude that this unfortunate expansion in the use of animals as food has simply followed human population growth. However, the story is not that simple. The growth of animal-based food has, has exceeded the human population growth rate. In other words, more animals are consumed per person per year. In 1961, global per capita meat consumption, excluding fish and seafood, was 23 kilograms per person per year. In 2014, this has nearly doubled to 43 kilograms. World per capita fish consumption has more than, more than doubled over this same period. Per capita dairy consumption has grown and is predict predicted to keep growing, particularly in the global south. These figures can be contextualised for Australia too. Despite much advertised interest in plant-based foods and vegetarian eating in this country, animal product consumption remains strong here. Australia maintains its top spot amongst the highest per capita meat consumers in the world, and despite a decline in milk consumption, demand for cheese, butter and yoghurt is stable or has increased. UN food and agriculture figures suggest that seafood consumption by Australians has more than doubled on a per person basis since 1961. This shift in the availability and consumption of animal-based foods has been part of an important story of the way in which we have witnessed a global restructuring of human diets. In part, some of this restructuring has been traced by some scholars to processes of colonialism where traditional diets were replaced by European approaches to food, a process that went hand in hand with attacks on traditional ways of viewing animals and nature, including attempts to dismantle indigenous knowledges which accorded agency and recognition to non-human beings. As Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience and Environment, Kim Tallbear observes, and I quote, Indigenous peoples have never forgotten that non-humans are agential beings engaged in social relations that profoundly shape human lives, end quote. This story also resonates with Australia since our agricultural sector 
which includes vast pasture lands, perhaps some of the largest in the world, across much of the continent, has directly benefited from, the, benefited from the theft of land, which was part and parcel of our colonial history. Wendy Foley describes the impact of colonialism on Indigenous food practices as, quote, cataclysmic. And she says, she goes on to say, separating people from their traditional lands and waters, limited access to traditional foods, end quote. So what can we say about this picture? Marx gives us an interesting perspective, I believe, to consider. Humans need food in order to survive. An economic system in order to produce must ensure that living beings who produce value within that system are able to have their subsistence needs met in order to continue to produce productively so that the system can produce profit. In Marx's language, Capitalism must produce a means of subsistence which allows workers to reproduce their own labour. The restructuring of human diets has included a strong emphasis on the proliferation of animal-based foods. As I've discussed, this proliferation is partly a symptom of the problem we have with an economic system whose driving rationality is to produce because production itself is profitable. This leads to an overproduction of commodities, and like so many other commodities which we have around us, they are proliferated and must be disposed of. Cars, mobile phones, appliances, and way too much plastic. Food is just another commodity that is overproduced. We know this overproduction, and this is the sad part of the story, is not evenly distributed. Instead, we face a bizarre situation where some human communities lack an adequate means of subsistence to survive, while there's manifold wastage of overproduced food, of food products elsewhere in the system. Further, as Jason Moore and Raj Patel have noted, the process of creating cheap food goes hand in hand with the drive to dra drive down the wage bill of capitalism. Produce an abundance of cheap commodities and you effectively increase the bio buying power of wages. But this simultaneously puts downward pressure on the wage bill for the system since low inflation reduces demands for wage increases, a reality that actually is playing out today in the Australian economy. For Moore and Patel, this, qu this quest for cheap food explains the rise of chickens, particularly as a food source in the 20th century. These beings can be reproduced, contained, grown, slaughtered and distributed using rationalised and horrific industrialised technologies. Thus, chickens have become the most consumed land animals on the planet. We have here, then, a curious metabolic relation between animals and humans, which has been generated within the context of the history of capitalism. The massive expansion in the use of animals is driven by an economic rationality, which assumes that production is necessary for growth, profit, and the creation of value. Animals have been sucked into this process a situation that has progressively intensified, so now that now trillions of beings now face the violence of intensive industrial production for hum human food supplies. This has led to a proliferation of animal products as a means of subsistence for humans, cheap fuel, if you like, which allows humans in turn to reproduce themselves and contribute labour to the production of capitalism. Here, our food system captures the energies of animals, which in turn provides the, us humans the energy we in turn feed into work under capitalism, not only in the form of wage work, but other labour, including care work. Indeed, if we treat food as another energy source of capitalism, that is a means of subsistence for us all that contribute productivity to the economic system, then this gives us a different way to look at animal agriculture. We can see that we simply face another sustainability problem in relation to human energy supplies. The reason I think this is a useful approach is that it allows us to gain a more complex and comprehensive picture of the way in which animals are implicated within our global economies. And thus the use of animals for food has become tied intimately to questions of human survival and the future of human productivity. It's for this reason that I don't think we can simply imagine that demanding that people stop meat is the only, or indeed is an adequate solution to the complex problem we face before us. Instead, we face a challenge of how to deal with economies and structures, which in turn have shaped human cultures, practices, and preferences. It's not that individuals' decisions about diet are unimportant. 
It's that we need a program of action that deals with the problem of produ production with as much zeal as we approach questions of consumption. It is here that I'd like to propose some different ways to think about the politics of production and the levers of change available to us. This will require us require some very different lenses from simply encouraging consumers to eat less meat or adopt a vegan diet. We could divide these strategies into three levels, the level of the state or the government, at the level of institutions and cultural change, and finally at the level of grassroots action and social movements. Each of these approaches are potentially useful, but have their limits from a strategic perspective, at least from my standpoint. At the level of government, there are a number of ways to think about change. Perhaps the most obvious role for the state is as a regulatory power over production and consumption. If what we are imagining is a form of just transition, that is a planned transformation of an existing high carbon emitting form of food production towards forms of work and production that are more sustainable and can provide meaningful employment, then perhaps the state has a distinct role. Perhaps here is shared thinking on transforming animal agriculture through Green New Deals or similar might have merit. Note also that such a transformation might also partially meet the demands of animal advocates, either by promoting high welfare animal agriculture or even perhaps agreeing that some forms of animal agriculture simply should not continue on the basis of the harms delivered to the environment and to animals. But I should note that there are significant tactical problems before us in relation to how the state might be, en might be enlisted as an agent in the crisis that currently faces us. I'm not telling anyone anything new when I point out that at least here in Australia, the state has proved an obstacle so far rather than an ally in any meaningful response to climate change. And it feels unlikely that we're going to see a significant shift in policy anytime soon. We could also express some suspicion about the capacity of the state to challenge the strong vested interests in industries that warm our planet. This has certainly shaped, as we all know, the politics of coal globally. There are similar strong economic interests tied to animal agriculture, and these are often the elite interests of large companies and wealthy individuals and families. The Australian Chicken and Meat Federation, Chicken Meat Federation, tells us that just two large integrated companies supply 70% of Australia's, chick Australia's chicken meat for consumption. We should also take note that some of the largest landowners in Australia also happen to operate some of the world's largest cattle stations. In this context, my hope is that we have solutions that will guarantee equitable outcomes and not me merely continue elitist agendas. Ideally, any solution must facilitate a fair transition that maintains the livelihoods of those employed um, through alternative work, for example, and must have strong buy-in from the public and not alienate people or heighten existing forms of inequality. Perhaps, in some ways, institutional change or culture change might be a different approach. And some of these solutions, I think, are closer to home uh, in the institutions and structures that we inhabit every day. That is sites of work, education, sport and family. Here I'm thinking in particular of the work of my colleague who's already been mentioned, Professor Danielle Selemeyer, and her work on systems and institution change in the context, context of human rights. She suggests we take a, quote, ecological approach to change, acknowledging that we must work with institutions and cultures to change not only everyday practices, but work on the individuals themselves and how they are formed. And Selemeyer states, and I quote, one must create, curate the conditions on which, under which those subjects emerge, end quote. He, instead of using the blunt stick of the law to change behaviors, we could instead shape everyday practices and institutions in such a way as to make it easy for individuals to collectively alter their dietary practices and change institutional procurement processes. At this very moment, the University of Sydney is developing its next sustainability plan. A university sustainability plan is a powerful opportunity for the institution to make a significant difference, not only through purchasing and investment decisions, transport planning and waste management, 
but also cr through creating an environment within which individuals are provided um, with easy sustainability options which become normalised within everyday practices. Here, thinking about food practices seems like a massive opportunity because thousands of people congregate at this place. Maximisation of the availability of plant-based foods on campus is one of the most useful strategies available to us, I believe, for reducing emissions. There are, I believe, 60,000 students and staff at the University of Sydney. We can reasonably assume that tens of thousands of people pass through the campus every day. The university's own travel surveys indicate as much. I have not seen the data on how many meals are served at the University of Sydney, but I have seen a study of a US campus which suggests that one in five students purchase a meal on campus at least three times per week. Perhaps if this same figure is replicated at the university, this would suggest a massive number of meals served every day, particularly if we include catered food for conferences and seminars. The implications of moving towards a greater proportion of plant-based foods on campuses would be immense. A 2014 UK study by Scarborough and others suggests that pr producing a high meat diet creates 2.5 times as many greenhouse gas emissions as an equivalent calorie plant-based diet. In other words, for every meal served on campus, there's an opportunity for a significant reduction in emissions through university procurement. Importantly, and this is where the culture change comes into it, this would subtly challenge everyday food practices Rather than assume that animal-based foods were the norm, there is an opportunity for a meal on campus to reinforce a sustainability message, not only in relation to greenhouse gas emissions, but in, also importantly, an opportunity to reduce the violence we expose animals to in our intensive food systems. However, while I think there's much to be done on an everyday level with institutions and culture change to alter practices and knowledge, we are not necessarily getting to the heart of the problems I discussed in this, uh, at the beginning of this lecture. That is the challenge of animal-based food production and the economic system which has contributed to the climate crisis we now face. The story I've, I've told you today about the explosion in the production of animal-based foods over the 20th century and beyond, the way this has restructured our food supplies and the way this is deeply connected to the logic of our economic systems tells us that moving away from animal agriculture will not be, not be easy since intensive animal agriculture has, ha, has been, it would seem, welded on to our ways of life. It is integral to our economies and seen as integral to our food supplies. This is a problem we have all in, inherited and much like thinking about how to make our energy supplies sustainable, we cannot achieve change unless there is strong consensus. Change proposals must not alienate and disadvantage some in the name of progress, particularly those who work in industries. In other words, if we are to transform our food systems, then those who work within them must be collectively involved and benefit from the process of change. It's here that we need a very different kind of politics that is able to address both the non-sustainability of current industries, but simultaneously work towards a more just economic system which is able to distribute resources more fairly and provide more control and choice to communities over economies. Here we need new alliances, not near, merely between animal advocates and environmentalists, but also with labour movements and communities who are trying to address working conditions and deal with the inequalities presented by our, our economic system. Allow me to give you two examples of opportunities for such campaigning. At present, wild capture fisheries, particularly in the Asia-Pacific, represent something of a social and environmental catastrophe. The growth of the global market for seafood has expanded wild capture fisheries to their absolute limit. Human labour conditions are shocking with the rampant use of low wage and forced labour in supply chains. The cost to animals is immense. As I've suggested, estimates suggest that up to three trillion fish are killed each year by these wild, wild capture fisheries. While current evidence suggests that fishes, uh, emerging evidence suggests that fishes experience pain and emotions in ways that are similar to land animals, it is notable that the bulk of wild fish capture utilises no basic welfare precautions, such as stunning before slaughter. 
Globally, there are a number of environmental and labour rights groups working to identify the use of forced labour in the industry and campaign for better wage conditions. Arguably, any attempt to raise the value of labour within supply chains will have a dramatic effect on the financial viability of the global industry, adding pressure to slow down the violence wrought by global wild capture fisheries. Supporting labour advocates will not only help to apply upward pressure on wages and impact the viability of fishing operations, but also build solidarity and exchange between labour movements and animal advocates. This will build awareness of the conditions faced by animals and promote a conception of structural change between workers and animal advocates that includes consideration of non-human interests. Here there's a powerful opportunity for labour movements, environmental groups and animal advocates to work together to address a common problem. One more example. Last year, the Trump administration announced changes to rules that would reduce the number of inspectors within US pig slaughter plants and remove a cap on line speeds for inspection lines. The effect of these changes would be, be to permit higher line speeds and reduce requirements to monitor from official inspectors. The United Food and Commercial Workers International Union in the US has already attempted to block the new rules arguing that increased line speeds would lead to higher injury rates for workers. Food inspectors have warned of the risk of, the, of unsafe meat making its way to consumers under the new regime. From my standpoint, line speeds within slaughter plants is an environmental justice issue. For our climate, the capacity to produce more meat more quickly is at odds with the directions we should be heading towards, that is to reduce the production of animal-based foods. For workers, increased line speeds means higher rates of stress and injury. Remember as well, and certainly in the US context, workers within industrial animal agriculture are frequently low paid, and there are many reports about the substantial involvement of undocumented migrants in this production process. For animals, increased line speeds means an increased number of stressed animals killed every year, and an increased demand to birth, contain, and utilise animals for food supplies. Here again, there is a unique opportunity for environmentalists, unions, and animal advocates to work together. And simply telling consumers to eat less meat will not solve this problem. Instead, we need a grassroots campaign to transform our food supplies. I've picked two examples that, in some ways, are at a distance from Australia. That is, it, that is industrialised fishing in the Asia-Pacific, and line speeds in hog production in the US. However, the lessons are useful for how we think about strategies in an Australian context. Over the last decade, labour conditions in Australia's food industry have continually been in the spotlight, with unions such as the Australian Workers' Union highlighting the systematic exploitation of workers, often short-term migrants. As a whole, Australia's meat industry is comparatively strong in terms of its unionisation, However, there are areas such as chicken production where there are now numerous reported breaches of labour rights. Once we recognise animal agriculture as an environmental justice issue and recognise this is a problem we all share, there is scope for a variety of interests, unions, environmentalists, animal advocates, community groups to be in conversation about how we transform our food system. Further, as I've discussed, Animal agriculture is interconnected with the history of indigenous dispossession and the colonisation of food systems. This means that our food system has evolved directly from a settler colonial legacy. From this standpoint, in Australia, any conversation on how we change our food systems must happen in dialogue with First Peoples and their movements towards self-determination and food sovereignty. I think it is fair to say we are in a period of crisis significant change in how we do things, how we live, and what we value is likely to occur within our lifetimes. But crisis, I believe, creates unique opportunities. It thrusts unlikely stakeholders together as allies and establishes the groundwork for new ways of living together. As an animal advocate, I believe we are facing an extraordinary time of contradiction, but also an amazing opportunity. On one hand, within our food systems, Animals are used on a scale that cannot compare to any time in human history, and the impacts of this food system on our planet, including billions of wild animals, is absolutely devastating. 
However, the crisis creates new opportunities for change. The old debate between environmentalists and animal rights folk now seems to lack the relevance and urgency it once had. Instead, we are all being called to address a shared problem before us and presented with an opportunity for a more just outcome for humans, animals, and the environment. In all of this, I do not want to suggest that individual decisions that we might make in relation to this crisis are unimportant. On the contrary, our personal ethics, our capacity to reflect on what is happening around us and alter our lifestyles to adapt to our current circumstances seem self-evident as a responsibility within these times. However, we need to do more to address the current crisis. With, with respect to animal agriculture, swinging the pendulum towards the problem of production means opening the conversation about how our food system must be transformed and how we should work within, within um, the, this system of production to achieve something fairer and more sustainable. I believe we have the opportunity now to make this transformation happen. Our success will depend on the quality of the alliances we can build, our commitment to democracy and inclusion, and our ability to articulate a vision for a fairer society. Thank you very much.